This is the Real Wealth Podcast, where we explore all things wealth related. Join us on this wealth journey. Let's get into it. Eddie Blackburn, welcome to the Real Wealth Podcast. Thanks a lot. This, for everybody listening, is our take two of this podcast because I'm massively <laughs> fucked up the last time and the audio didn't work. So thanks a lot for your patience and thanks for coming back. <laughs> no problem, mate. I appreciate you having us on. I like you guys and um, I was happy to come back on. Um, and yeah, happy to hopefully inspire and help some some of the listeners. Awesome. Awesome. I, I think the first thing that strikes me about you, and, and we'll talk about, about all the different things you've got going on, because there's a lot of places we can yeah. go with this, but you know, you, you strike me as someone who's really mastered the wealth formula, the wealth creation formula that a lot of people struggle with. Um, what do we need to know about your background to explain who you are now and, and the journey that you've been on? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd give you the shortened version, <laughs> obviously. Um, so, so I did grow up with nothing, got a pretty shit upbringing. Sorry, I'm allowed to swear on this. That's all no, right. No, swear, yeah? swear all you, you want. You're Scottish, you Scottish. I don't give a shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I had a, a pretty uh, bad upbringing, didn't have anything growing up, grew up in a high rise block of flats and stuff. Didn't have anything, um, got in with the wrong crowd, was very close to going down the wrong path and getting up to all kinds of no good. Um, then I got into sales, sales changed my life um, and started to make good money at a sort of young age, around about 19, got into property, that scaled. What, what was it about sales that for, firstly attracted you to it or you know, what was it that, that really made that change in your life? Um, I was making £400 a week as a joiner at the time yeah. and I got made redundant and then I got into this sales job and I made £400, I think it was the second or third day. The first week I made over a grand and I was like, hold on, like I can make three or four times the amount. Now, all I'm doing now is using my voice and my personality opposed to using my hands. And I was like, that that's a bit of me. That. So I sold my tools pretty quickly. So to answer the question, what what about it? What about sales? Was it early on? It was I must admit I was 19. It was purely about money. It was about money, and I didn't particularly enjoy standing on building sites in the freezing cold, in the rain, like manual labor. Like I didn't enjoy that. So it was part of. I found something that I quite enjoyed, and and yeah. obviously the money aspect. Um, but but before I know we're digressing a bit, but sales to anybody listening, if you master sales, like you've got a head start in pretty yeah. much any other type of business because you're either selling a product, a service yourself you're selling to an investor you're selling to a bank you're selling to a mortgage lender why they should work with you like people don't realize how involved sales is in pretty much every aspect of your life yeah Um, if you don't have sales you don't have a business right no not not at all and things that your partner like you've got to sell to your partner why they should be with you right why they should come on a date with you why they should move in with you why they should do whatever you've got to sell to your children why they should listen to you and yeah. do as the tools, which is quite difficult, uh, as we all know. But like sales is all day. It's it. Everyone's doing it every year. They just don't realize it. Um. So yeah, M- massive part of the day to day life without even realizing. Yeah. So you got into sales. Um. You know, you you found there was a way to sort of multiply the amount of money that you could earn with your time. You kind of found a, a passion for it. And h- how did you take it forward from there? So from there, so I worked for Combined Insurance Company of America. So it was an American insurance company selling um, ins- personal insurance. Yeah. So um, cold calling. Imagine at age 19, I was told, right, you walk into the bank. And I was so naive and so I didn't know any different. I walked into a bank, right, trying to sell them a product that they sold to their customers. <laughs> I waited in line and tried to sell to the cashier. And they were just yeah. looking at it like I was a, some sort what? of lunatic. Mm-hmm. The because hell I, I just honestly to? didn't know any different. Yeah. And I would just I had a script to follow, I had a process to follow. And I was just so enthusiastic because yeah. my first week I made 400 quid. Uh, or f- first couple of days I made 400 quid. First week I made a grand. I was like, my belief was up here. So I was yeah. like, oh my God, I found something I can do. And like everyone used to doubt us and say I would, I would amount to nothing. I just found something I... I that I loved that I was really good at. Yeah. Anyway, so progressed through that business. Um, and then I got headhunted for MetLife Europe, which was biggest uh, insurance company in America. Uh, big MetLife building in New York City. You've probably seen in the movies and stuff. Yeah. Uh, 
So yeah, I was a look, youngest ever sales manager for them, ran the Northern UK for about six years, but I was only 21, 22 at this point. Bear in mind, financial services, insurance is dominated by 40, 50-year-old men yeah. in pinstripe suits with white hair, and I was the young kid with tattoos and like Geordie <laughs> lad who just came in and took it by storm. Yeah. Um, and I just, I honestly believed at the time and I don't know if it was true or not. I just believed that I was the best at it in the country. That's just what I believed. And I had this, I don't know where the belief came from. I don't know if it was instilled in us. I don't know if it was because I hadn't really done much in my life up until that point, apart from be a nightmare and be a chav. Yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's all I've really done and just worked myself and in, in being argumentative and got into fights and all that my whole life. And then I found something I was good at. I just had this like chip on my shoulder and this attitude was like, I'm the best at this and I'm going to be the best at this. And I'm going to, I was saying even early doors, I'm going to be in MetLife. I was saying, I'll be the biggest team in the country. And I was, I said, I'll be the top salesman in the country. And I was and and from that, when I was 24, I think it was 24, 25, um, I set up my own company called Bespoke Financial. So again, at that point, there's loads of other mortgage brokers and insurance brokers across the country, as as I'm sure you know, thousands of firms. And I said, like, on my first couple of weeks, like, I'm going to be the biggest firm in the country. And everyone laughed, like, yeah. laughed. They were like, you, young kid, what, how are you going to do it? We've been going 25 years. And in about four or five years, we, we achieved that. Won awards in uh, Barcelona, Iceland, Berlin, all over the shop. Um yeah, and, and, and from that, that kind of links to the wealth thing that along the way, along that sort of journey, even at MetLife, I was buying properties Yeah, because I was making 80, 90 grand a year as a 20-year-old as a kid with mm. no bills, no responsibilities. Um, and then it went up to 150s and, and, and really sort of... Sort of to, but but that, to, even that itself to say, you know, you were making all that money, you didn't have any bills, you know, was it inherent within you not to start growing your liability column as as the money started to flow because that's it you know you, that age you start to get a chunk of money you're like right i want a ferrari you know what wh <laughs> yeah. where, where did that that come from to kind of temper it because that that i think that's the interesting thing to me there mm. must have been a journey at some point where you you said okay i'm starting to earn a lot more money now here i need mm. to understand how to manage that and you know what i'm going to do with it yeah, I mean, I think, I, I don't know what it was. I, like, during my upbringing, my mum didn't have any money. And then when I was about, I think I was 10 or 11, she set up a business. Uh, she set up a recruitment agency. Mm -hmm. Done really, really well. Was making good money. I think she was making at the height of it about 10 grand a week net. Wow. So she was doing really, really well. But then she lost it all. Um, and we we went from the flat to a nicer house, not a mansion, I mean, a nice house, but then then back to a, a smaller house. So I think maybe I'd seen like what can happen. You can get money and then it can disappear if something happens. So maybe yeah. when I started to make the money, I was like, I need to safeguard this a little bit, which I think was what pushed us into property because I just thought I've got this money sitting here. I did obviously I wasted some, you know. Any twenty-year-old lad in it's Newcastle gonna, yeah. with a bit of crack will, you know, go out and enjoy themselves. Um, but I just, I don't know. I just kept a lot of it, and then I started to invest in properties. I was buying properties cash, you know, low value, crappy properties, just doing the wrong thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. If there's one like standout thing that happened. I don't know if it was a little bit in his, or I yeah. just maybe had a little bit of the of being scared of losing it. I suppose. I think I think that early lesson from your mother is 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 obviously planted its way in there, and and not many people get that. You know, I, I mean, I I came from a background where, you know, we we had a a fairly comfortable life, but not wealthy by any means, and you know, we lived in a nice neighborhood, but we're kind of at the bottom end of 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 the the wealth spectrum in that area, and I was aware of that. So I always I kind of had the other sort of drive of, you know, I never really had that adversity, but I wanted much more. So I think I went through my entire 20s, you know, albeit I got a good job, I was traveling a lot, I was on a six-figure salary, but I was spunking most of it, you know, bigger house, bigger car, even although I was abroad most of the time and the companies were paying for my accommodation, I still had a house at home sitting empty most of the time, you know, because I had to have those things. And, you know, it took me into my 30s to really learn those lessons of, 
you know, wealth accumulation and the fact that you can't just keep growing your liabilities as, as your, your income increases, you know, uh, it sounds like, I mean, obviously you're, you're well on, on your wealth journey now in your early thirties, it, it, it was round about your age, around about 33, 34 that Laurie and I started our journey. So we're, we're way behind, you know, and, and it's because we didn't have those lessons instilled from a younger age. And obviously you're definitely not getting those lessons from school, right? Mm. No, no, not at all. The whole system is 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 com- it it's all set up in a way that they don't want people like us. They don't want because if ever if the whole world was filled with people like us, it would be a mad world, and then nobody would work for people like us if everybody was like us. So exactly. the, the system exactly. wouldn't work. So they can't have everybody like us. That's why. But there's obviously other reasons. Who knows? Actually, the real reasons. It's it's probably a whole podcast episode to go into that. I know. But, um, it, 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 who actually knows and. And, and you're right. And I think it's interesting hearing about people's stories. And most of the people that I've interviewed or spoke to or friends that I have who are highly successful, not many of them have said to me, I had a fantastic upbringing. We had loads of money and I had everything that I've ever wanted. Yeah. Like, I don't recall actually anybody who's who's had that type of upbringing who's then doing massive, massive things. Mm-hmm. Most people have had some form of adversity, some sort of difficult time, some sort of experience that's happened to them. Um, it's either the fear of, you know, going into something or, or yeah. moving away from something or the the really like a huge desire to get something and be somebody. But that's normally from adversity, isn't it? It's Yeah, it's- it- the fact is, you know, if if you're coming from a position of comfort, you know, because you've had a good upbringing and wealthy parents and all that, it's, it's really hard to have that drive to push you on for something else. You know, it's just too easy to stay in comfort. Why why would you push yourself out? So, yeah, I mean, it seems to be a common theme with with a lot of uh, um, entrepreneurs and people that are doing well. That you know, that's the, 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 there's a backstory, there's a drive that's that's been created within them. The other common theme that I seem to hear quite a lot is mindset. You know. Mindset seems to be the number one thing that every entrepreneur talks about. It's one of the first things we talk about in our courses to try and get people's head in the right space. So, you know, what's been your mindset journey? Is it something you have to work on? Is there hacks that you have or is it just something that's inbuilt in you where you wake up every day and you're ready to smash it? I think anybody that says the wake up every day and they're ready to smash it, I think is lying because I don't think anybody is like that. Although they might perceive to be that way on social media and tell you that that, that, that way. And that, you know, I just think that's a bit of a smoke and mirrors. I don't think anybody's like that. Everybody, no matter how good or talented you are and how driven and motivated and how strong your mindset is and how, you know, resilient you are, you're yeah. going to have difficult days. You're going to have down days. You're going to have days when you're more tired there's going to be days when you spring out of bed as well and you feel like you're invincible. You feel like you're Superman. Um, everybody has those, but um, but on the mindset thing, if you link that back to my journey, I think if I look back, because I've been asked this from other financial services companies, like how did I sell that much life insurance when I was 21? Yeah. When, when really if I was knocking on people's doors and then coming away with bank details and they'd never even met me before. That's a bit mad when you think about it. It's a, like, an a incredible cool journey in such a short period of time, right? Yeah, it, it is. And and like it you I must have been doing something right to persuade people to give me the bank details and set a policy up for them when they didn't even know who I was or who I worked yeah. for. I just knocked on the door. And my closing ratio used to be really good, but what I'm getting to is I think the difference between me and the rest of them or majority of them at that time was my mindset because my mindset has evolved definitely. And you definitely, I think you mentioned if you've got a tips or hacks and everything. Yeah. But I think as a starting point, my mindset was I will outwork everybody. So because I'm younger, I thought I have to speak to twice as many people as the older people do. Yeah close the same amount of deals and that's how I started and I just like right I'm gonna outwork everyone I'm gonna get up earlier I'm gonna finish later I'm gonna have more coffee and more Red Bull and more monster drinks than everyone and I'm gonna see more people because sales is just numbers then it evolved to I got good at the work ethic thing and I got good at putting the hours in but then I, I defined the skills so I got better at closing better at talking to people and communicating better at product knowledge all of these things that then my mindset at that point was right. I need to improve my skill set to be even better than these. Because if I'm 
if my skill set's better and I put more t- hours in, there's no stopping me. So yep. I think mindset should evolve and it should change as you change. But I also think like it's it's not one size fits all and it's not just work every hour of every day to get successful because that's not always the answer. A lot yep. of the time it is the answer at the start, but there's the whole work and harder and smart. I think there's that argument as well, or you can do both. Yeah. Um, I, think- I, I always love the analogy of a, a, a rocket trying to take off when you're trying to start a business. You know, it's like a rocket uses 80% of its fuel trying to get off the ground. And then once it's going, you know, it's 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 much, much smoother. Um, mm-hmm. I, I feel like that with our business, the, the amount of effort, the time, the extra hours, trying to fit it in whilst you're managing a day job and, you know, trying to fit it around family life and, you know, you're getting up at 4 a.m. in the morning to fit in three or four hours before you have to start your day job, doing it at night, doing it at weekends, you know, huge amount of effort at the start to get going. But once you go and, you know, things, they're not easy, they're never easy, but, you know, they, yeah. they get they get somewhat more kind of structured at least. It, it's the momentum theory. And, I, and yeah. I've said this to my sales staff for years is, is a similar thing. It's like, imagine there's a train on the track like to get the train going, you need to start the engines, you need to get the passengers on board, you've got to have fuel in the engine, you've got to have a driver. There's all these things, and I, I have no clue how to drive a train, by the way. Yeah. They're annoying me, train drivers, because they're always on strike. But <laughs> like to get the train going, right? Like it takes a lot. But once yeah. the train is moving, it starts to gain a little bit of pace. Once that train's smashing it down the track, you can't just stop the train dead. No. So, so once you've actually got your train going and it's moving, it's actually quite difficult to stop it. So momentum can, once it gets going, it's definitely harder at the start. But once it gets going, it actually feels like it becomes easier. And even if you have yeah. to take some turns on that track and you're not going in a straight A to B, you take some turns, you go left, you go right, you go up, you go down. But like, it's it's not, what am I trying to say? It's once you've got that going, unless you change direction or unless you level up, like it does become a little bit easier. Yeah. And, and and that's what a lot of people I think fail to realize is they think we'll put some time in at the start. If it, if they don't get the wheels moving on that train, they'll then just think, oh, it's not for me. I can't do property. I can't do this. I can't do that. When in reality, if they just kept moving a little bit, well, that momentum will start to catch them. Yeah. And then they'll um, actually be flying down the track. And then if you put an obstacle in the way of a, of a speed train, if you put a brick wall, it's going straight through it. Yep. isn't it so like uh, uh, we've, seen, moving, gonna... we've seen so many examples of that in our property training business of of people that just put in the effort and and see it through you know the, the the things that they can achieve versus someone who probably came across quite well in the training but just didn't implement didn't get the mindset right didn't take the actions and you know they're, they're, they're going nowhere and they'll have every excuse of you know you know this wasn't right that wasn't right whatever but the fact is you take the actions you can achieve the results and the bigger the action you take the more results you're going to get you know it's it, it literally is as simple as that but you know we are creatures that are designed to stay in our comfort zone so pushing us out of our boundaries it's a really tough job you know I'm, I'm trying to work through my fitness journey just now and you know, I've, I've been, I'm doing four days a week in the gym. I'm doing everything I need to do in the exercise front, but I keep failing on the diet, you know, because it hits the weekend and, you oh, know, I want a curry or something, you know, it just, I just need to get that part of it right. And and I know it's just me trying to sabotage myself, you know. Mm. But sometimes, and this relates to property as well as fitness, you literally like, if it's business or property, you're one phone call or one week away from it all clicking from the train yeah. really getting pace but sometimes they'll quit just before that point mm. because they've had 20 no's of agents or 20 no's of landlords or 20 no's of whatever to give in but the 21st one could be a yes and yeah. it's the same with the fitness it's sometimes it's it's skipping that one takeaway that makes the difference and you and you look yourself in the mirror and you see that difference and then your belief goes up and then you you're off on you so it means you're that close to all just clicking into place, but the people give in just before yep. they get to that point, don't they? A really good example of this in our early journey, but before Laurie and I had established uh, real estate wealth development, we were both doing our own thing and we were both getting into the whole property investment thing and learning how to do it properly. So this is about 2018, something like that. 
And Laurie had been doing his sourcing thing, trying to find below market value properties, all that sort of stuff. And, and he had found some great deals, but also some struggles, but he'd spent a fortune. And I had, you know, put out a couple of ads on Facebook and he'd said to me, you know, it's a waste of time. You're not putting enough money behind that. You know, you're not going to get any leads off a 50 quid ad. And I'd done it a couple of times. And then I thought, right, I'll try it once more. And I put another 50 quid ad out and I got a lead in mm. for a property in, uh, near us in, in Alloa. I it ended up in a situation where I was busy because, you know, I was away um, at the time and, and Laurie was like, right, okay, I'll, I'll go negotiate the lead. If we do a deal, then we'll split it. And we ended up getting one of these ex-local authority phone blocks for 25 grand. Now, you know, even even at that point in the condition it was in, it was worth 50 all day long. So we got it for half price. That became the start of real estate wealth development. That, that was the first deal we'd done. After that, we'd done another deal together. After You know, so that decision just to try it one more time with that 50 quid ad on Facebook, one, we made 25 grand instant profit on that project, but two, it led to this massive company now. You know, that that who knows where we would have went if 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 I hadn't done that. So didn't do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, it just it just shows that 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 persistence at the start. That's it. And and that links back to what you said about mindset is part of having a good mindset is being persistent enough to not quit. Yeah. Like not not being a quitter is a mindset thing. It's been You've got to be a little bit tapped as well, by the way. I honestly believe that. Like, you know, the really yeah. academic people who are really intelligent, mm. there's not many of them, you know, who who nailed everything, A stores and everything. There's not many of them in business. And I think the reason for that is that their brains are really academically intelligent and they would think they assess a risk different to us. Yeah. So when we look at a risk, we're a bit more inclined to take a risk on. We're a bit more inclined to, well, I've had 10 Facebook ads say no, the logical academic person would probably have only tried one or two and think, oh, it doesn't work. Yeah. Because they need to see the result done. Whereas we, we're just a little bit different upstairs. Mm. And we're just like, we'll keep trying and keep going and it's, keep going. Just and, pa- and pathologically optimistic. Yeah. Sometimes to our detriment. Yeah. Because you see that the optimism in every situation and you're yeah. thinking, what happens if I do this deal and this happens and I make this and I did it? But half the time it's not there. But that just that mindset. Mm. takes you to a different place doesn't it and it's, it makes uh, you do the go the extra mile do the extra make the extra phone call do the extra rep in the gym because you're almost unrealistically optimistic on you yeah. about well, what you can the, and that that's the difference between laurie and i and that's why i love working with him because he is super optimistic i you know i am optimistic to a level but the, like he is on another level and he'll ask questions that i would never dare to ask because he doesn't one he doesn't care two he's obviously overly optimistic about what the result of that's going to be and sometimes <laughs> it's really beneficial to do that right yeah 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 absolutely and it is a strength and and i think as you as it's certainly in my own journey i think as i've progressed as a businessman i think i've learned cause honestly i think there was a good period of my career where i i believe my own like optimism i, I yeah. literally thought 100% that that was going to happen what i was thinking it was going to happen yeah. like because it, it was part of that i was saying things i was saying we're going to be the biggest life insurance brokers in the country we're going to have a hundred staff and, all, and, it, and it was happening so then i was believing my own hype yeah. really but then as you develop i think you've got to now be self-aware enough which is another mindset thing you've got to be self-aware enough to realize right what's realistic mm. what's optimistic what's pessimistic and then it's normally somewhere in the middle, isn't it? It's it yeah. you don't normally achieve the highest heights in every single thing. But but being self-aware enough to realize that, because if you're too optimistic, you might think if you're buying that property below market value, you might think, oh, the revaluation is going to be 200 grand. So I can get all my money out. You get an investor in, but then it actually comes in at 150. Yeah. Like you've been too optimistic on the end val, which then means you can't pay the investor back and get you in trouble. So there's there's times for it, and, and I think I've certainly learned that, um, certainly with property valuations, you you can't be too optimistic. Yeah, no. when there's mortgage value. Everybody, involved. everybody's had a dodgy val in their time, you know. 
Yeah, 100%. Um, 100%. I, I, it's for me as as well. It's just you know you, you saying those things, those targets, those big goals. You, you know, it creates a level of visualization and it, it just forces you to think differently about how you you could achieve it. You know, very early on in our journey, we said right, we want to get to to two hundred properties. How are we going to do that? And if we just said right, we want to get to fifty this year, we, we'd have been thinking about it very differently. So we had to figure out you know, how to buy portfolios because that was the only way that we were going to, you know, grow to that level. And I think that's it, you know, forcing yourself to, to create big objectives, big goals will force you to think differently about how to achieve them. And, you know, that's that's where a lot of the, the big wins can come, right? Mm. So, 100%, 100%. So one of the things that I wanted to ask as well was, um, mm-hmm. you know, you, you you obviously mastered the whole sales thing. You, you created your own business. How do you transition from being really good at what you do to managing a team, you know, making sure that they're really good at what you do and, and they are given the service you want to and, and grow that exponentially? Because I think you ended up with something like 100 people working working in the, the, the mortgage broken life there insurance was, business, right? There was probably 130-ish oh. staff across all my companies at, at the height of it. Um, yeah. I sold that business and I'm probably down to... I've kind of got rid of all of that and then the, it's back up to probably 35, 40 now because yeah. I bought a bar, a restaurant, a coffee shop, a glamping site in there, sort of things. Um, but but you, you rose a really good point because a lot of people, let's use sales for an example, they get really good at sales, make lots of money, lots of commission, and then they think, right, I'm going to recruit a team now and build a business, selling whatever you're selling. But yeah. to manage people and to sell, is a, it's miles apart. It's chalk and cheese. It's it's it honestly it's it's completely different and everyone falls into this trap the thing i'm good at sales i'll find 10 people who are just like me who can sell just like me and it, it's never yeah. ever the case they never yeah. care as much they never as good or the different style to you in managing people is 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 completely different and that applies to every type of business you know if you're a property developer to recruit an administrator is challenging because they're very very different to you tech yeah. people and creative people marketers they're very different to business leaders. So you've got to be almost a chameleon and try and adapt to who you're speaking to, adapt, and you've got to find out what makes that person tick and why they want to come to work. Because some people come to work for a paycheck. Some people come to work for progression. Some people come to work for recognition. Some people just come to work just because they have to, and they're not really bothered. You don't want them people. Some people need a goal, or they need you to dangle a bit of a carrot Yep. to say, well, if you do this, you're going to get this. And and I've definitely made a lot of mistakes recruiting that many people. You know, you can imagine that was over 100 of those were salespeople. So managing wow. that many salespeople, obviously I wasn't directly managing 100 people that, that had managers who managed people under them. But yeah. um, I had to train pretty much all of the staff at some point. Um, I'd done two meetings a week every week for probably eight years sales meetings that is sales training and it's just a very challenging noisy loud business that um caused no end of headache it was very profitable and it was great to be involved in because it was a laugh as you can imagine having that many sales people it was definitely good fun um but i think tips and advice for people if you if if you're doing that transition would be read up on management books because mm-hmm. Like the one minute manager, chimp paradox. Um, what else have I top of my head? Um, I'm only saying that because I can see them over there, but the, there's quite a few good anything yeah. by Brian Tracy. Um, eat that frog, so, that's a really good one, yeah, definitely. In, in how to win friends and influence people, great book. Because if you tell one of your staff, right, John, go and do that, John won't want to just do that because he's being told, he might because you're his boss. But if you say to John, if you do that, this is going to happen or you're going to get this or that might happen or if you've done this, it might have an up effect to this. You've got to make him want to do it, not just tell him to do it. Yeah. And I tried to implement that in the sales staff and it was quite easy in a way because I can't just say, right, sell more because why do you want to sell more? If you sell more, you're going to get this bonus or you're going to get this commission. And then once you've got the money, you can buy property like me. Yeah. They want to do it. 
different different approach completely by that point. Now, I think it's easier to a certain degree to motivate sales, especially if there's commission involved and you know there's that direct relationship to their financial well-being and their performance gets a bit more challenging with you know your managers and you know your admin staff and support staff and all that sort of stuff and i think that's what a lot of people struggle with in business they may be very good at the core business but all the other shit that comes with it understanding the financials and tax and managing your cash flow and making sure you've got enough money to pay the quarterly vat coming in and all that it's for me, the pressure of, right, I know I've got payroll at the end of this month. Let's make sure we've got enough cash in the bank to to make sure everyone gets paid. It's a scary place to be sometimes. Definitely. And, and a couple of points on that, like everybody's got their own skills and everybody, typically entrepreneurs aren't that good at the spreadsheet type stuff. So if that's your weakness, you need to either recruit or outsource because you can't just leave those holes unfilled in your business if you want to really scale and one thing I learned after a couple of years, I wish I learned it earlier, was you have to pay well for good people. Because once I started to pay well, or pay better than I was, should I say, in terms of the, the employed, not the sales staff, the, this is the administrator, as the managers, the office manager, the ops manager, those type hires. If you try and do it on the cheap, you're going to get lower, a lower skilled person Yep. And that only means you have to dip in and it, they don't do what they've been told or they don't do it the way that you want it to be done. And the second I started to pay, you know, 30, 40, 50 grand to some of these people to bring good people in, all of a sudden overnight, pretty much, it went like that because like good people want well paid. Not, not yep. everyone who's good is a business owner. There's a lot of people who are in employed land, which is absolutely fine. And they are really good at what they do but they want paid well and, yeah. and rightly so because they know the worth and they know that they're good at what they do. So absolutely, you, you've got to get your head around that, but you can't really do that day one. I think you've got to go through a little bit of that pain and a little bit of the journey and learning about different types of people and um, pay them well, outsource, delegate. And we do um, just weekly meetings. Yeah. We do two weekly meetings now, which is a, which is a Monday meeting, which sets the tone for the week. Everyone's got the task, delegate, right? This is what happened last week, and this is what we need to do this week. Pass the tasks on to all the different members of staff, and we do a sign-off on a Friday. Yeah. Have you done what you were meant to be doing? If not, why not? If there's anything that's happened throughout the week, we'll talk about that. And every week, it's just those two meetings. And sometimes we do a check-in on a Wednesday, but, but people need that. You can't just yeah. give someone instruction in the first week in the job and expect it to get done how like no, you absolutely would. not you need to be reinforcing things you need to to be reinforcing yeah. what's acceptable what's not you know what you know congratulating people when they're doing a good job as well you know i mean the the soft skills are really important in management and a lot of people forget mm -hmm. about that there's a, there's another yeah. really good book on on this um by rob moore called life leverage uh, and you yeah, know he talk, talks about you know but broadly speaking you know it's it's a good book for anybody that's trying to even start a side hustle because it talks about how you can free up more mm -hmm. time how you can systemize things how you can basically outsource delegate or eliminate things in your life that just aren't, aren't adding value it makes you start thinking about the things in your life that are adding value mm -hmm. and bringing you closer to your goals and the things that are taken away from that, you know, the amount of time that people spend on their phones all day, look at your screen time, your three, four hours a day of absolute nonsense on social media or your two or three hours at night on television. And, and this is all time that could be used much more effectively to get you closer to where you want to be in life. But again, you need to come out of your comfort zone. Mm, definitely. And I think a lot of people, they'll say online maybe that they're going to do that, but they're not prepared. They no. want all this success over here, but they're not prepared to pay that price. They're not prepared to sacrifice Netflix. They're not prepared to sacrifice going out on the weekend and getting smashed all weekend with the mates. They're not prepared to sacrifice things to get to where they want to be, and then they're just jealous and they're envious of the people who are where they want to be. Absolutely. But nobody's this iceberg thing, isn't it? Nobody sees what's under the water. They only see the tip. And, and yeah, and, and that applies to everything. Like... Uh, part of my journey, I set up a different business alongside Bespoke. So I set up a company called The Mortgage Genie. So The Mortgage Genie was preliminary, well, mainly, obviously, mortgages. Bespoke was mainly life insurance. I wasn't a mortgage, but I wasn't qualified to do mortgages at that point. Yeah. So I'd done an intensive course to do to be CMAP 1, 2, and 3 qualified. 
to do mortgages, which is a brutal exam. But like I had to literally every morning I was up, I think it was something like half four because I was still running all my other companies at this point. I was getting up at half four, revising for two hours every day. Wow. Yeah. And then I was doing a full 10 to 12 hour shift and then doing the same. And I'd done that for probably like four weeks. And then I, I got two distinctions and a merit on a really difficult test. And I'm not academic. No. I'm really not. But, but, but that's, the hours that's an example of work. like, I know that that, and I sold that business as well. Just, that was the first business that I sold. I've sold it a couple since. That that was like really difficult, but I was just prepared for the sacrifice because I knew I could build a business on the back of it that I could sell. Um, oh, and that, oh, and everyone's got those examples of, 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 but that was a real, real hard one. Mm. That sacrifice, it really was because I had to get up early and learn about something I didn't even enjoy or want to learn about. <laughs> But I knew there was a reason I was doing it. it and, yeah. and I think that's what it comes down to. Um, Bigger prize at the end. Absolutely. Yeah, if you've got a strong enough reason why, you'll get it done. Okay, cool. So let's, I want to talk a little bit about your uh, journey into property. So, you know, obviously you were starting to make a bit of money. It sounds like this kind of happened quite early in your journey as well. So you were still building the business. You had some yeah. cash. You thought, okay, well, you know, let, let's get started in property. So let's talk a bit about your property um, journey. You know, I know that you you invest in a lot of sort of multi-unit assets like HMOs for people that don't know what that is, house of mul multiple occupation where you're kind of renting out by the room, uh, guest houses, you're now into serviced accommodation and you've got these uh, glamping, pod, this glamping pod site, which is kind of similar to what we are doing at the, the Black Lock Resort. We've got the water sports there and we're planning to do 12 lodges and a restaurant. So you know, really cool investments going on. So so talk about your journey and, and, and why specifically you went for that strategy predominantly in property. Okay. Um, so early on, I just started buying buy to lets that were really cheap because I had some money and I knew I needed to do something with it. I sharp learned that that wasn't right. I had someone, uh, I think there was an attempted murder. I had all sorts of drug dealers in there, boilers, pinch, trash, the fire. I had all sorts of mad stuff in these mad properties. Um, I learned, and then I went to normal back to lets between sort of 80 and 100 grand in the Northeast, which at the time was was an okay sort of um, strategy. Got a little bit bored of that. Got to sort of 20 of those, and I got a bit bored. I went, went to HMOs. Got a load of them, and I was a bit bored of that as well. So then went to Airbnbs. Got a little bit bored of that as well. So as you can probably tell, I I, I, I shouldn't say bored. It's more once I feel like I understand something and I've got a process for it in a system, and it works, I feel like I'm ready to go to the next thing. Yeah. And so half the time before I've even mastered this one, this skill of whatever it may be, I, I'm already got my eye on the next one. So when I wrote my book, little plug there for your line. When I wrote my book, um, I, I already knew what the second book was going to be about, and it's it's already written. So oh, you're done with I the second book as well. That. Say again. I, I said that's you done with the second book as well. Yeah, well, well done. Yeah, it's already done. It's been edited now. It should be out next month. Um, but before I'd even finished that book, I was thinking about the next book, and I've just by the time I finished this second one, I already know the third one. So I don't know. I don't know why I am like this. I just am. But it was then it went into the Airbnbs. Then it went to um the guest houses. Um, then it went to a larger hotel, which I've just bought, which is 17 bedrooms. That's got a bar, restaurant, coffee shop at the back. Brilliant. Bar conversion at the at the back as well, where I'm probably going to do weddings. So that's going to be a, a new thing for me because you can charge quite a bit for weddings. <laughs> went into yeah. went into glamping. Um I, I don't know, it's it's just something in me that that likes to once I feel like I've got some uh, you know. If a hundred percent of something was like I've got it in an old inside out and back to front, by the yeah. time I'm like 80, 75, 80, I feel like I'm ready to go to the next one because my team are behind me sweeping up and putting the systems and processes in place. So then I can replicate if I find That's a HMO, I just slot it into that process, yeah. find a battle let's slot it in there, guess how slot it in there. Hmm. Um I think yeah, I think that's the thing specifically with that strategy. When you've got HMOs, you've got guest houses, you've got hotels, you've got rooms to rent, and and that in and of itself is a business. It's not like a, a standard buy to let where you just stick a tenant and forget about. You know, it's something that you need to keep on top of. You need to make sure that your occupancy rates are up. You know, you, you need to make sure that you know the, the someone is filling those rooms uh, and. 
you know, I, I guess there has to be a system in place for that and a, a management process to keep on top of it, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I think, you know, because I was in business before I was in property, I cast myself more as a businessman than a property investor. Yeah. Although I obviously do both. Like, I see Airbnbs, you're completely right. And the hotels even more so and the glamping even more so. It, it is a business because you can manipulate results daily. You can, On a buy let you can't change the rent daily. You, you, yeah. you can't do it on HMO either. But Airbnbs, you can manipulate rates. You can change the spec. You can add things on. You can put champagne in the room. You can mm. you can find out if there's a concept in the area and lift the prices. There's ways to yeah. get more out of a property if you're good at business, if it's an Airbnb, a hotel or anything else glamping we're going to honestly you should see the stuff we've got planned for this glamping site we it's going to be a hotel in a field yeah. effect we're going to have it, it looks to mega actually I, i've seen some of the stuff on your social media the other day and you've got these big domes with like the games room and then you've got like the yeah. yoga workout area and it looks incredible really yeah, I mean, cool. again this is where the business element in property kind of meshes together a little bit because this has already got a cafe on site yeah uh, there's number one on TripAdvisor in the area already before we even bought it. Uh, we've only complemented that, made it more profitable, changed the menu a little bit. We've then built all the pods, extended the car park. We've then built a yoga studio. So the reason for that is we're going to sell it as a as a retreat. So retreat. corporates can come and book the whole place out for the staff, go and do meditation, go and do team talks in the dome if they wanted to, go on walks, yep. go on bike rides, all that type of stuff. Um, the games room is all about being in the northeast because we get, we don't exactly get good weather all year round. Yeah. Why would you go to a glamping site when it's raining if there's nothing else to do in the local area? You don't want to go on a walk. There's something else for kids. So that yeah. was a strategy to increase occupancy levels. Mm -hmm. But I don't think a lot of people, a lot of these property investors, I don't think they look at it like that because they're just looking at it purely from an ROI or, you know, a return on capital employed or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and, and the, the devil's in the detail with this stuff because, you know, you can make as much or as little out of the same asset as as you can. Definitely. You know, I mean, our HMO, and we, we've got about 11 HMOs, I think, in total, but we've got three in Grangemouth near, near where we are. And one of them was historically an HMO, and it sat empty for like three years. Mm. Uh, you know, and since we've taken it on, you know, maybe cost us 130K in total for the building. We're now getting three and a half grand a month rent for that thing. And it's like mm. fully occupied deal done for three years. And, you know, it's the same asset. Okay. We've invested a little bit in it, but you know, mm. you, you can make as much out of it as you put in and, you know, things like you're talking about that make the difference that, you know, focusing on getting your trip advisor rating up, you know, focusing on having, you know, appeal to the people that you're trying to target that are the right fit for that area you know, uh, understanding the weather around you and, and what sort of activity you're going to be interested in. You know, we are, we've got the water sports there at, um, at, at the Black Lock Resort and, and that's already running as a business, even though we're going through planning for the rest of the development. But mm. our focus just now is building the site reputation. So lots of people are going up there, they can go there for walks, they can go there for food. We've got a snack van on there just now. There will long term be a restaurant, but we want people using the site so they know where we are. And and you know that gives us some initial growth, some inertia when we when we finally do the, the main development, and you know it's just being able to focus. And I think a lot of people do too much too quickly as well. So if you don't give it that focus, it's really easy to see how you're not going to get the most out of the asset. Mm. You, you, you bang on it and spotting opportunities that other people don't are often where you get the biggest wins. Like that HMO, you probably got it at a discounted price, I'd imagine, if it's yeah. been that empty for ages. Other people have overlooked that. Other people have thought there's no demand or it's not big enough, whatever they've thought, and you've just looked at it from a different viewpoint and, and made it work. And yeah. like the glamping site was that, was that. I mean, this hotel that I've got with the bar, restaurant, and coffee shop, the old owner was doing 200 grand a year. But like on, on the... um. On the particulars, when it was on, it was on with Christy and Co. On the particulars, it all all it said was turn over two hundred k. So loads of people would have maybe overlooked that. I found out he was only open seven months of the year, oh, and wow. he didn't even serve food or drink to anybody local. It was only hotel guests. Wow! So instantly, and he based the purchase price on a multiple of that income. 
So people just hadn't seen that opportunity. And I got that in the steel. I got it for 700 grand. It's already been valued before we opened the doors at 1.35. Yep. And I didn't, I only spent about 150 ish. On it. So, like, and I didn't really do, do nothing structural. Like, people just missed that opportunity. But that's that that 1.35 is purely down to an unopened business. So, once I've got two years trading, I could probably get this to north of two and a half. Yeah. So, but everybody overlooked that because it was only open, it was two people running it seven months of the year. It was a lifestyle business yep. that completely, and this has been on the market for ages, completely overlooked it. He had no offers. It was marketed wrong, but that's that's when your business acumen comes into play, when you can see things that others can't. Yep. And just because you're a HMO, for example, just because people tell you it's a HMO, that doesn't mean that that should be the strategy. Mm-hmm. That, that might be an SA. It might be three flats. It, might, it could be anything. But yep. if you can look at it holistically and be creative in your brain and think, well, I, I could do da-da-da-da-da, like a lot of people aren't doing that. A lot of people are tunnel vision and narrow minded and they think, well, that's what I need to do and that's it. It's just it's just having a different view on things and understanding that there is a world of opportunity out there. It's it's down to to you to fish it out and you know and interpret it. You know, it, the the whole black lock thing for us came about last year because we were looking for a, a lodge development by a lock in Scotland. Um and it, it was a project that we wanted to do. It, ne- it wasn't necessarily like this This is a great business opportunity, but, you know, it was something that we wanted to, to go through a process on. And we were looking at land near Loch Lomond that was like millions for, for a, a plot for a couple of lodges, you know, like not even big, big lodges. And the, the opportunity for the Black Lock came along where it was a fishery business. So it was like, uh, currently they've got 22 boats. People go out onto the lock and fish. You know, it's a 124 acre lock. We don't own the lock, but we've got access rights to it. So we've got like exclusivity on the lock. But this this business was for sale for 250 grand and it had seven and a half acres of lock side land. And I'm like, you know, I I was just automatically assuming this business can't come with that land as some sort of trick yeah. here. And it wasn't. It was like seven and a half acres of land. It's next to the Forestry Commission. So the Forestry Commission do a lot of deals where they'll lease you their land and, and you can build on it and extend. So it's not just the seven and a half acres we've got. It's the opportunity to extend back and lease land from them and grow it to quite a big resort. So, you know, it's, it's just viewing these opportunities for what they are and what they could be you know, and then, and not kind of pigeonhole yeah. yourself. So yeah, I totally agree with that. And uh, it's, it's a really good point. So I, like, I feel like there's so much to talk about with, with you, Terry. So yeah. I do want to kind of move on from the property yeah, and we could do a full thing just about property, but um, I want to talk a little bit about your book, uh, Be a Lion. Um, and you know, that we, I, th- I think we, we had a brief chat about this before and just uh, I was talking about my frustrations and challenges with trying to write our first book. You know, we, we put out Fast Track to Property Millions in January and it literally took us the whole year before that to, to write it. Mm. Just because I struggled to sit down and concentrate on it. Um, and, and you seem like a guy that's like high energy, got lots going on and, and all that and just understand the process of how you knock out a book when you've got a million and one other things to deal with and you're not someone who strikes me as likes to sit down for long periods of time and 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 knock out a book you know i do at the minute because my seven month old son it doesn't sleep um yeah. so i'll be like lying down all the time but um but yeah what well, the, the reason i done the book was because just i wanted to get my message out there and i think i, I say things slightly different and i've got interesting content so i'm told so that was the reason and then i thought right well i'll beef out a concept and I was just thinking about it one day, um, the concept of it. And then I thought, right, well, a bit similar to yourself, where am I going to get time to write a book? How long is this even going to take? Yeah. Like, and, and if if, you, if anyone's ever tried to do this, if he's trying to sit down with a pen and paper and write a book, you just go, uh, you just freeze on, you just like, where do I start? Oh, no, go. even if you type in it, you freeze. So I was, I, I, I decided, I set a goal and I went, right, well, I'm going to write this book. Um, I'm going to transcribe it. So just on iPhone, just that transcribe app when you talk and it writes it for you because I yeah. thought I could definitely talk quicker than I can type or write yeah. it. Um, 
and I set myself a goal of doing it in, in six weeks. So I thought, right, I'm going to, I read I re- the concept first and then I sectioned it out in uh, right, the, the different chapters of the book and the different concepts. And then I literally just every morning spoke for probably about 45 minutes to an hour every morning just yep. on the transcribe app. And then I got someone to edit it for us and condense it. I think I spoke about 280 pages and we condensed it at 230 because right. a lot of it was me repeating myself. Yeah. Um, it's natural yeah, when you're yeah, trying to get a point across, you like to hammer it home a few times, right? Well, yeah, 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 exactly. And and I just, but but I, I'm I'm kind of, I am very impatient by nature. And I think if if I commit to something, then it's like, I just go all in and probably to my own detriment sometimes because it takes focus away from other things until it's done before I can move on to the next thing. So every morning I was like, non-negotiable i'm getting this done in six weeks um so that's how i done it um well, yeah, tell, so tell us about about the book then yeah so it won um which, which just puts my belief up even more than uh, my message so it won hollywood book festival of the year last wow. year paris book festival of the year san francisco book festival of the year i don't know i mean how on earth is Fantastic. that happening? that's and amazing got a, it got a global gold ebook award and it got what was the other one? Got something else anyway. Um, but the concept is is actually something I used to talk about my sales training, is um as a concept of a lion. So a, a lion is, you know, if you visualize and you picture a lion in your in, in your mind, it's the king of the jungle, it's a dominant creature, it does what it wants. I can't imagine a lion like being told what to do by another animal or <laughs> Like not yeah. doing what it wanted because it was scared of something. It it lines to my basic knowledge of lines, by the way. I know very little yeah. about animals. Um, like they just go and do what they want. So the analogy came that came to fruition of like lions just do what they want, when they want, with who they want, wherever they want in the jungle. They don't think they don't see a hyena or a wildebeest and think, I'm not gonna be able to eat that today. They just go and chase it, don't they? So yeah. that 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 could be about your goal. So stop thinking about I can't get that goal and just go and run. Just start running. You might, you might miss it. It might escape you. You might actually catch it. You might need some of your mates to come along, some of your pride, some of your other lines to come with you to go and catch it. But if you don't try, you're definitely not getting it. Absolutely. So it all that's how it all came came about. And obviously, I built on the analogies in detail in the book. There's the analogy of the hyenas. So everybody's got or experienced having hyenas around them. So those horrible creatures, they're, they're laughing at you, they're taking the mick out of you, they're putting you down. And a good analogy in the book is like, if you're a strong lion and you might be positive and you might be fearless and all of this and you've got good self-belief, but if you've got one hyena coming towards you and snapping at your heels, you, you can fight that off. But if there's a big, you know, if there's 20 of them around you, they're going to drag you down no matter how strong you are and how resilient you are and how tough you are. They're going to win. Yeah. So that's about like, have you got hyenas around you? And if you yeah. have, it doesn't matter how good you are. They're going to drag you down eventually. So it's about it, minimizing your contact with them, getting away from them. It can be partners, friends, whatever. Um, It's so true though. I mean, the, the it it, is, especially it? when you don't come from a background of entrepreneurship or starting your own business or, you know, there's just so much skepticism about it in your network, you know, like, why, what are you doing that for? That's not going to work. That's never going to work, you know, and it's just all these little negative comments that kind of chip away from, you know, from what you're trying to achieve, you know, it's keeps so many people in a place and people feel uncomfortable with someone else reaching out of the group and striving for something new, you know, it just everybody's just keep everybody in their little comfort box and we'll all be good and we can all sit here and you know we can go to the pub on a saturday afternoon we can talk about our little comfort box and you know i've seen it so many times you're completely right and to to a degree it's not their fault so these a lot of these people unless they're being malicious with it they just don't know any different they just like their limiting beliefs you know what life is about and what you can achieve is here yours is completely different that doesn't mean that you're better than them that just means you're different i believe that's a much better way of thinking but they might just think well i just want to go to work get paid go and get drunk on a weekend get married have a house and that's it that's fine if that's what they want if yeah. you want more but you've got to be self-aware enough to realize if you want more you can't be hanging around with them because if you hang around with five 
alcoholics, you're going to have a drink. Or if you hang around with five gambling addicts, you're going to have a bet. Like, you can't get away from that. Yep. Like, you're a product of your environment. Um, and I think everyone gets the hyena and the lion analogy because everyone's watched David Attenborough and they've seen yeah, exactly. hyenas trying to attack a lion and a lion. Very relatable. Yeah. And, no, but and but the, the underlying you know, point is, with, with that is, you know, down to this, show, show me your friends and I'll show you your future you know network is net worth those things that almost become throwaway comments because you hear them mm. so often but it's so critically importantly true you know and it's actually been a challenge for us to find the right network uh, to, to surround ourselves with you know I'm, I'm really lucky that i work closely with laurie and connor and their mindset's phenomenal and you know we, we work on a regular basis but you know, we, we, we're not in Silicon Valley. We're, we're not even in a major city. You know, there's, there's not a lot of people doing the sort of thing that we're doing and have the mindset that we have around us. So it's like things like this, like the Real Wealth Podcast, where I have the opportunity to speak to people that are like-minded and get that inspiration and drive, you know, are, are massively important. So even if you don't have that network of people around you, there's, there's so many resources from books to podcasts to networking events where, where you can get that, you know, get, get round the right people that, that can really help you move forward. Right? Mm. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And, and I, I personally struggle with that a little bit as well because, like, you get in with a group of people and, um, like, if you outgrow them, like, all the books tell you that you need to find a circle that are doing more than you. Yeah. But then if you're really ambitious and you're really good at what you do, you'll outgrow that circle. So then you've got to find the next one and, and you've got to keep moving around. But that can make it a little bit lonely because like you just keep jumping around and then you don't like fall out with these people, you know, when you move to the next group. But I, I do believe you need to keep pushing yourself and putting yourself in different environments where there's people who are miles ahead of you. Like one of my business partners in the, well, my business, there's only one business partner in the glamping business. The, the billionaires that he's got his own jet like and i wow. speak to him and i'm like what like some of the stuff he talks about <laughs> i can't even comprehend but like he made me not in a bad way and certainly not intentionally he made me feel like like a little tadpole and he's a shark yeah but but like i don't know why i keep seeing animal analogies by the way but that, that is a good one as well but, but, but it's understandable but, to everybody and that's yeah, the point yeah. you know yeah and 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 the point is like that is is you doesn't mean fall out with your current friends because that's not the right thing to do. It just yeah. means get yourself on a different pitch because they're playing yeah. a different game. So yeah. if, if you keep moving from pitch to pitch to pitch, you'll learn stuff from a certain group and you might get some really good friends that you or business partners that you, you end up working with or, or speaking to for the rest of your life. Yeah. But you've got to keep moving about and testing yourself. And I've just done that by my podcast by networking mm -hmm. uh, and just by going to little i know this is dead basic but like going to if you're going on holiday go to a really nice hotel don't go to like the four star or the basic one because yeah. you're trying to save money go to the really nice one because the conversations are different at the really nice ones the people you meet are really different at the at, at the really nice ones yeah golf courses like sometimes i work from home a lot because i've moved out away from newcastle but i'll go to the health center around here, not the health center. That sounds like it's the doctors. Like the the, it's like a private. Yeah, like club. country like, club, yeah. fitness country, center. Yeah, country club, yeah, yeah. But because people who sit there when I'm doing my work on my laptop, we're also wealthy people, and and you don't go there to just to gain a contact. But you just never know if you don't put yourself on that pitch. You yeah. ain't scoring the goal if you sit it, in the it, goal. It's, it's massive these opportunities for networking at, at, at these clubs and all that. You know, we we go to Glen Eagles quite a bit. We we members at Glen Eagles Townhouse, and and you do you bump into some really interesting people. Now, Definitely. this could sound like a sales pitch to our accountant to make sure we get tax deductibility for the cost of the golf club <laughs> and and the, the Cancun trip where you went in the five star hotel. But you know, genuinely, there's some games to be played with that sort of thing. Um, but you know that you mentioned the podcast there, and I think that was the, that was something I wanted to cover. So, um, rags to riches. That's obviously how we know each other because Laurie and I featured on your podcast. I think it was back in twenty twenty one, so it was a while ago. Um, it was, a good, but, it was it was a good while ago. I remember it was in it was in my old office, which I've, that business I've sold, and that that yeah. was easy. Yeah, it was two ago, wasn't it? Easy. Yeah. Um, so. 
you know, I, I, I listen to the podcast regularly. I, I think, you know, you have a similar aim to what I'm trying to do with, with this podcast. You've interviewed some incredible people from Alfie Best, the, the gypsy billionaire, to Rob Moore and a couple other heavyweights in property like Danny Inman. Um, it, you know, what, what was your goal in starting the podcast and, and what, what are you getting out of it? The goal initially was... And, and I don't, I won't say the name of the podcast because I don't, I don't want to discredit anybody. But there wasn't, a, from memory at the time in 2019, there was literally two or three property podcasts around. Like now, it seems like there's about 50. Um, and I didn't really think much of any of the other ones, if I'm honest with you. And I like listening to the podcast. I, I listen to some American ones. Um, but yeah. UK property is very different to American property. And I just thought, you know what? I, you know, I can speak to people, you know, everyone seems to enjoy having a conversation. Or most people seem to enjoy ha having a conversation with me and I get in a really good debate and uh, I like discussing things and, and I've got a good story, I believe. And, yeah. and I do know a lot of people. So it was a combination of all of those things. And I thought, I'll just do one. I've done it on a shoestring. It was like a banner ad on Zoom. It was like no prep, no money invested. I got a little microphone and a banner and that was it. Um, so I just tried to do it to try and inspire others to try and give a real story because yeah. I'm not going to name the names, but one of these other podcasts in particular that was out there in 2019, it wasn't even doing property, but just telling everyone how to do property. And I was just a oh. bit like, you know, that's not really how I operate. I operate with integrity and, I, you know, I'm not going to speak about stuff I don't know about. Yeah. And I just thought people would like it and then seem to take off quite a bit. Um and yeah, and actually, like you said before, off camera, like it, it for us as the host, it's quite motivational speaking to others, finding out their story. I sometimes feel a little bit exhausted after an episode, but then you feel like you've got an idea or you've got like a little bit of Lisa Life. It gives you a bit of a kick up the arse. Um, so then, and now I've started doing more solo podcasts just because pure time reasons. Hmm. Um, so I'm just sharing the way I look at things on, on my solo podcast at the moment. Just to, yeah, just for time, because I'm doing them like late at night or early morning when uh, I haven't got any guests. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's it's always really cool doing, uh, you know, in interviews with someone else. That the conversation flows generally pretty well. I, I think yeah. it's, it's maybe not so easy doing it on your own, but there's a few things that I, I feel are really, a few messages I really want to get out there. And I think the best way to deliver that is just to do it on a solo podcast. So, you know, it's yeah. definitely something I'm going to be doing a bit more of, uh, you know, I feel like there's, there's a big conversation to be had around cash just now. And the fact that people are, you know, sitting with money in the bank rather than investing it and building their asset column when depreciation is massively high and interest rates are low and the government's printing money for fun and debasing the currency and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's, there's things that I think need to be addressed. And the best way to do that, yeah. I think, is is on those those solo podcasts. Yeah, definitely. And for me, it's just very much, I could literally talk about, if someone just gave me a subject, honestly, nothing to do with like academic, like I can't tell you anything about science or like geography or history or all that crap. Um, but like anything to do with business, I can talk about. So yeah. like my social media team just, I say, right, I'm going to do some solo pods. Will you just send us some headlines? And literally I just freestyle it off the headline yeah. and talk about whatever. And everyone seems to love it. Mm. Um, and I quite enjoy it. Um, I don't know where it'll end up going, uh, if I'm honest. I don't know. Like a lot of people are doing more video content now, aren't they? But you need a proper studio. I don't know if I'm going to go down that route. Um, I've got a lot. Of, I'm a businessman more than anything. Like yeah. I like sharing my story and my journey and inspiring others. I'm right, going to write 10 books in 10 years is the goal. Wow. I, I, I felt like after the first one I didn't want to do another one, but you know, I, I just need a, I just need a year to heal and then I'm I'm sure I'll change my mind on that. <laughs> yeah. But I think like, I just want to do that because what appeals to me about podcasts as well and audio books and and books is it's gonna outlive me. Yeah. And nobody might listen to them or read them, you know, when I'm gone. Who knows? But it, it, like my kids will have it and they'll know about it and yeah. that's kind of what it's about and I've had people in America people in Dubai people in Australia somehow read the book like yeah. and they're like presenting these amazing messages and I've changed the life and I've done and I'm like oh my god like wow. 
then I'm craving I'm craving that feeling a little bit as well. That's making me again going back to the start about the belief thing. Once you visualize something, you make it happen, and then you get told or you get recognition. You, you, that makes you want to do more of it. Absolutely, and, yeah. It's, it's and um, fuels it. Fuels it. Yeah, and there's definitely that for me. Okay, cool. Um, I think the the last thing I want to ask is the question. I, I last question I asked every guest is, what does real wealth mean to you in your journey? Real wealth. So I mean, there's all there's all this debate about what rich means and what wealth means and and all of that. So it depends on the way you look at wealth, I suppose. But um, just when you first said that to me, what pops into my head is wealth is wealth isn't just for you and wealth is like it's holistic so what i mean by that is it's it's comprehensive it's not like you're just in a high paying job or you've got a well you know a profitable business that's not i believe proper and true wealth is like a real wealth is like it's comp- it's it's almost indestructible so that would be if like what's happening right now. So if you just have buy to let and all your fixed rates are coming to an end now, and that's your sole strategy and you're a full-time property investor, you might be shitting yourself because you're not going to make any profit anymore. Absolutely. That Even if you had a hundred of those, that's not really real wealth. Whereas if you had buy to let and HMOs and SAs and businesses in hospitality businesses and all these different fields and you're doing coaching and you're doing and you do all these different things, but like that's true. And then they're all making money. There's doing all those things, like some people, and they don't even make much money. They try and do 20 different things and do 19 of them not very well. Yeah. That's a different thing. But if you do them all, then you get them all positively cash flow and all profitable. They almost become indestructible, like a bit like Rob Moore. And I know some people give him a bad name, but I like Rob Moore. He is very salesy, as we all know. He's always selling something. But like, if you look at what he's done, I mean, he's got a letting agent. He's got loads of properties. He does developments. He does a podcast. He does courses galore. He's got a low mem- low entry membership one that pays every month. He's got the yeah. medium courses. He's got the high end courses. He's got one to ones. He's got. I mean, I don't even know everything that he does, but. He looks pretty indestructible. So if, yeah. if rates go mental, it doesn't bother him. No, no, he's got, he's got enough the... going on. I, I mean, I, I'm a he... I'm a big fan of Rob. I, you know, I, I think you know his his content's really good. There's there's uh, a few of his books that I've read recently that I thought were were really mm. good. Uh, love the Disruptors podcast. Love his Money podcast. You know, he, he speaks. Um, about current affairs quite a lot he's got a really clear view on things you know he mm. gives good examples explains himself well you know i think the guy's the guy's obviously doing very very well and uh you know he's, yeah. he's a good one to listen to so yeah I get and, that. And, and, I, and i would say i would say that like obviously i don't know his current affairs i, I don't, obviously don't know if you know a lot of it's even true there's that aspect to it as well you can't really trust what you hear online yeah um I think it is that, you know, he's been doing it long enough, but real wealth to me, just to summarize is somebody, if you've got real wealth, you are somebody that has profitable businesses in different industries that aren't impacted by each other. So if one, if an external factor like the market or your reputation or uh, you're getting sued or something, yeah, something went wrong in, wrong in one of them, it wouldn't impact the other. You've yeah. got at least, I would say, four or five different things going on. You're obviously wealthy in, like, I know health isn't linked to, well, I suppose it is linked to wealth, but you've got to be a whole package for me. You've got to be healthy. You've got to have a good mindset, and you've got to have all these different things going on to call yourself truly wealthy. Yeah. Um, and I think that, very that, that diversification, that. you know, where where you've always got one tap on at least to keep, keep you moving mm-hmm. forward. You're not going to be... Uh, overly dependent on stuff if we were fully dependent on our buy to let portfolio just now then you know it wouldn't be a great place to be because as you say interest rates are up massively you know it is perhaps one of the best buy-in times in property for a long time but you know the the cash flow takes a hit in that situation you know you might be able to buy them very cheap but you know your short-term cash flow is going to be pretty poor until interest rates start to turn around again but you know it's just balancing those opportunities you know and if you've got enough things going on as you say it's uh it's uh, you're on to a winner um yeah, definitely. so thanks a million this this has been a really great 
conversation. I appreciate your your patience as well coming back after the last disaster. Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you, check you out online, uh, how can they get in touch? Um, so Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook, it's Terry underscore Blackburn underscore property. Um, yeah, book is on Amazon, Audible, the audio books on uh, Audible. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, put links to that stuff on, on the show notes anyway. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Happy to help anybody if, if, if they want to ask anything, um, t- you know, time permitting. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, no, I hope you've, uh, hope you've enjoyed it. I hope I've helped some people and thank you for having us on. Awesome. Thank, thanks a million, Terry. Uh, this has been the Real Wealth Podcast. I'm Alex Robertson. Thanks for listening. And I hope you join us on this wealth journey.